Thank you. Good to be here. Good to be here. It's good to have all of you with us. We try to study the Bible a little bit this morning. Let's pray. My Father, Lord, I need wisdom. You say if we lack it, we ask of God. And I'm asking, Lord, I'm asking for the gift of teaching. And I ask to, that you give the heart, the folks' hearts that were, that are receptive, that want to hear, and uh, glorify thee. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, now, if you have uh, your Bibles, will you turn to the book of Matthew chapter 1? What I'm going to do today is uh, I'm going to deal with the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven for just a few minutes in Sunday school this morning. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. There's a lot of folks that teach that, they're, uh, that the terms are interchangeable and synonymous. And so they make no difference between kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. A lot of good people teach that. They love the Lord, no question about that. And uh, that's not the purpose in here today. I, hope, I trust that you'll be willing to uh, approach this with, with an open mind and then let the, uh, let the Scripture deal with what it's going to deal with. And I believe you'll be, you'll, uh, you'll be better off for it. Uh, in Matthew chapter number 1, verse 1, it says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, and the son of Abraham. If you'll notice that Abraham is 1900 B.C., David is 1,000 B.C., almost 1,000 years later, yet, uh, yet uh, David is listed before Abraham. Why? Because it's a Davidic kingdom. This is the genealogy of the king. This is, the, uh, this is a dynasty. It's the royal line. You have two books in the Bible that have the geneal in the New Testament that have the genealogy of Christ. One is Matthew, the other is Luke. Luke deals with his humanity all the way back to God. Matthew deals with the credentials as the king. In Matthew, therefore, it is a book that is definitely Jewish. It is, a, it is the gospel that is so Jewish that up until the 13th chapter of the book of Matthew, we are dealing specifically with the kingdom and the king. Chapter 1, you have the genealogy of the king. Chapter 2, you have the birth of the king. Chapter 3, you have the herald of the king. Chapter 4, you have the preparation of the kingdom. And then chapters 5 through 7, the constitution of the kingdom, which is the Sermon on the Mount. Chapters 8 through 9, the credentials of the king. Chapter 10, the message of the kingdom. Chapter 11, the rejection of the kingdom. Chapter 12, the unpardonable sin shows up in rejecting the king. And then in chapter number 13, turn over here and you'll see what happens. In the 13th chapter, 13, quite coincidental. In the 13th chapter of the book of Matthew, something shows up. Just bang, all of a sudden a profound change takes place. In Matthew chapter number 13 and verse number 3, he spake unto them in parabole, parables. The parabolic state starts. The knowledge of the kingdom now and the, and the clear witness to it enters into a hidden mysterious state into parables. And uh, a lot of folks say a parable is an earthly message with a heavenly meaning. That's fine. That's a surface thing, though. A parable has a far deeper meaning than simply a surface mean, uh, something happening on earth with, with, with a heavenly meaning. A parable is a way that God conceals the truth so that he can reveal it onto, only to a certain few. What is this for? This is in preparation for the blinding when God blinds Israel to their king and to their kingdom. So the 13th chapter of Matthew, we enter into a parabolic state or into parables. And when John the Baptist shows up, look at John chapter number 1, verse number 31. In John 1, verse 31. Notice clearly what he said his ministry is to. John chapter number 1, verse 31. I knew him not, but that he should be manifest to Israel, that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. John the Baptist said plainly, my ministry is to manifest the Lord Jesus Christ to Israel. That's what he said. 
and uh, that's why you have to you have to be very careful in your uh, dispensational aspect of the scripture and what you're dealing with when you look at the Word of God. What I'm giving you this morning is so very, very important because it covers a number of perspectives. Number one, it shows you that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are two different things. I'll show you that in a few minutes. Number two, it shows you, shows you how a Davidic kingdom, the kingdom of David, is being offered into the Jews and the Jews reject it and they reject the king. And by doing that, God puts them into a blinded state and he begins to bring parables before them. And of course, the only way the parable could be understood is if God reveals it and manifests it to them. In the first king that shows up on this earth is in Genesis chapter number 2, if you'd like to turn back there with me. In the book of Genesis chapter number 2, you'll see a king showing up on this earth. And God uses <clears throat> the terminology of... Uh, of a kingdom. In Genesis 2 and verse number, uh, uh, verse number, uh, let's see, let's look over here. Verse number uh, 8, Genesis 2 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, and so forth. And what you find following here is the creation of Adam. And if you'll notice in verse number, chapter number 1 and verse number 28, subdue it and have dominion <laughs> over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. What is that? That's the domain of a king. What, what's happening? God had just handed Adam the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And since Adam was not a fallen creature, he also had the keys to the kingdom of God at the, at the same time, simultaneous. But when Adam sinned against God and fell, he lost that authority. And that went in Luke chapter number 4, if you'd like to turn there with me. That went to Satan. In Luke chapter number 4, verses 5 through 7, And the devil, taking him up to an high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said, All this power will I give thee in the glory of them, for it is delivered to me. What is? The kingdoms of this world. Now, if the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are synonymous in the same thing, then what is Satan doing ruling over the kingdom of God? That's a tough question if you believe they're the same. But he said plainly, the kingdoms of this world are mine. What kingdoms? The kingdom of heaven that's on this earth. The kingdoms of this world. The kingdom of heaven is a physical, literal uh, uh, kingdom. And uh, Satan had that kingdom given back to him he had lost it because I have, I believe, by indication of Scripture, is that he had it before Adam sinned, and he lost it by sinning when he was cast out from his position of authority in heaven. Look at Revelation chapter number 12 and verse 1. Revelation 12, 1. Revelation 12, 1. Scripture says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. All right. You see this? All right. Now, if you look carefully, there appeared a great wonder in heaven. Verse 3, Behold, a great red dragon in opposition to the woman. The woman is Israel. In great opposition to the woman, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. These seven heads and seven crowns represent the seven successive kingdoms that Satan has used in the kingdom of heaven to rule over this earth. He started with Babylon, which was Nimrod. If you'll notice, when he began to rule on this earth, he ruled through Nimrod, 
who was the first rebel in the Bible. He was, of, uh, he was a Hamite, under the descent, he was a descendant of Cain under, uh, uh, through Ham. Nimrod, then we have Pharaoh, who's an Egyptian, Sennacherib, an Assyrian. Then we have the four kingdoms that show up through the, through the image that uh, Nebuchadnezzar raised up in the plains of Dura. And they are Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Rome is the last kingdom that Satan rules through on this earth, and it goes into a mysterious state. It has, uh, it has a bottom section with two legs, which represent a western and an eastern division of the Roman Empire, which took place in 1050 AD. The eastern division was located in Constantinople, Byzantium, or as it's called, Istanbul, Turkey today. The western division of the Roman Empire is in Rome. It culminates in feet that are mixed with iron, that, that, uh, that, that the, composition, the, uh, the composition of the feet are, is iron and clay. And it is a mysterious thing because they won't mix. But a stone that is cut out of the mountain smites that image on its feet, not its legs, not its midsection, not its head, but on its feet. In other words, in the final manifestation of the Gentile kingdoms ruled over by Satan, this stone smites the image on its feet and its collapse is complete and total and, and, and instantaneous. It just comes down and it's done away with and the wind blows it away and the stone cut out of a mountain will establish a kingdom, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. That takes place in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15 where it says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. So the kingdom, when we're talking about the kingdom of heaven, which is a physical kingdom, when that kingdom is manifested, it's manifested right now in a satanic manner because it is being controlled by Satan, not the church. The church is not reigning on this earth. The church is not reigning in heaven. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And that's exactly what we have today. We have a manifestation of wickedness uh, unfettered, like we've never known. But this kingdom is going to come to an abrupt end. And it's going to come to that end at the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is in stages, according to the book of Revelation. Now... <laughs> when we look at these kingdoms, we see seven of them, seven crowned serpent. Notice that it is a dragon. Satan is a dragon, great red dragon. When you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, only one gospel says anything about a new birth. And which one is that? John. And of course, you all are quick to respond to that because you've heard me say it time and again. Why does not Matthew, Mark, and Luke refer to a new birth? Because the new birth was not part of the Jewish kingdom. That's why. The new birth was not part of it. The new birth has to do with the church of the living God. And Christ had to die on the cross. This is the new covenant of Hebrews chapter number 9. Without the death of the testator, the testament is not in force. He had to die on the cross and make the atonement in order for the new birth to be ratified or to come into effect or to have power. So they're not there. Satan fell before man was ever made. In the book of Isaiah chapter number 14, if you'd like to turn there with me, you'll find Isaiah 700 years before Christ recording this fall. <coughs> Isaiah chapter number 14 and verse 12. How art thou fallen from, who, from heaven, O Lucifer. Lucifer is a, is a Latin word. And it's not Hebrew and it's not Greek, it's Latin. And it means to carry light or a light bearer. Lucifer. And so therefore he's called Lucifer, son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? And on follows here in the 14th chapter of Isaiah is his fall. And his fall is from what was given to him. He had dominion. We don't know, understand, we don't understand all that's involved in it. Nobody does. There's a lot of different takes on what went on on this earth before we find it in that condition. 
Let me bring this before you briefly, but you think on it for a moment. In Genesis chapter number 1, the evening and the morning were the first day, evening, morning, second day, evening, morning, third day. You have seven days. You have six days of creation and the seventh day of rest. All right? The Lord God rested from His work. There's two ways that that's looked at. One is that that's looked at is the original creation that God created in six days and on the seventh day He rested. A lot of good people believe that. Uh, brothers and sisters, many of you in here probably believe that. The other way that it is looked at is that those six days are recreation or restoration from an original creation that took place in time immemorial in the past, somewhere in the past. Why do people believe that? They believe that because of a couple of things, that, a number of things that are mentioned in the scripture. Number one is that he said to Adam, replenish the earth. Number two, it says in Isaiah chapter number 45 that God did not make the earth tohu vabohu. That's what you find in Genesis 1. The earth was without form and void. The form and void translated into English is translated from the Hebrew tohu vabohu. Just go look it up. That's all you have to do. In Isaiah 45, the Lord said, I did not make it tohu vabohu. I did not make it without form and void. It was made in a pristine condition by the creative act of God. So the situation where Satan shows up and God says to him when he tempted Adam in the garden, he said, and because thou hast done this thing, a specific thing. Uh, in other words, this has to do with the progressive fall of Satan. And I brought you a message a few years ago about that. How that Satan, when he was cast out of heaven, was not completely cast down into hell fire. He's been cast out progressively in stages. And if you'll notice in Revelation 12, when I just read to you a moment ago, it said that, and Michael fought against the dragon and found no more place in, in heaven for the dragon. So he was finally cast down to the earth. And it says there that he knoweth he hath but a short time. Uh, there may be other positions. I don't know what they are, but I do know this. I do know that if you take the position of the, of the earth being created in the six days, then uh, what you have there is, uh, is uh, simply recorded for you, simply set forward, straightforward, what you read in Scripture, that man was created on the sixth day. And, of course, that does match the number of man because the number of man is six. And 666 is an intensification of man or mankind. And the name that God gave Adam, he gave him a generic name. The name Adam in Hebrew simply means of the earth, of the earth, of, a, of, a, of the earth, an earth kind. The first man uh, was earthly, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So there's a contrast between the two. But if you believe that, uh, that, the, that, it, that the account in Genesis 1 is a recreation or a restoration of an original creation... It opens up the door for all kinds of speculation as to what might have been on this earth before. And when you study the Old Testament and find passages that refer to beings that, were, uh, that, uh, that, that don't fit, that, uh, that just don't appear to, to belong, you can't, you can't place them. Uh, like the Rephaim over there in the book of Isaiah, I think it's chapter 25 or 27, somewhere in there. He said, they are the dead. All right, that's the Hebrew word translated into English dead is the Hebrew word Rephaim. In other places in the Old Testament, that same word is left untranslated. Get a, get a concordance and just type in Rephaim and you'll find it pop up. See, so the King James translators translated in one place, but in another place they did not translate it. Are you following me now? Same word in one place it's straight out of Hebrew. What you've got is an, is an English form of Hebrew word. In another place, you've got a translation. Where they didn't translate it, they simply said the Rephaim. What did they connect it with? The giants. Everywhere the Rephaim show up in the Old Testament, they're connected with giants. But in the book of Isaiah, where it is translated, it is translated, they are the dead. And the King James translators probably, when they translated that, thought to themselves, well, what are we going to say here? If they hadn't translated it, it would have, they would have had to say, they are the Rephaim, which would have opened up a can of worms completely. So they did translate it. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not, saying, I'm not speaking of it in a critical sense. I'm trying to cause you to observe. But here's what it says in the context. Here's what it says in the context. 
God has visited and destroyed them. They will not rise. And that's, that's quite a thing because the Bible says in the book of, uh, in the, I think it's, the Lord said it in John, that the, the hour is coming when all that are in the grave shall hear the voice of the Son of God and come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. They don't exist anymore. What are they? That's where you have to go back and find out what the they are. The they are connected with the Nephilim, fallen angels, cohabiting with the daughters of men, and producing a hybrid race of spirit beings on this earth that are neither man nor angel. They are the giants of Greek lore, the heroes, where they get their gods from and the pagan cultures of this earth. That's who they are. And because they are neither, God destroyed them. And they do not rise. They have no resurrection. They have no existence. They're not men and they're not angels. But it's a warning as to what's coming. I'll be talking about that later on in the message when I'm preaching this morning. So what we have going on here in the Old Testament is some things that lead people to believe that there might be some, a lot going on that the Bible doesn't necessarily teach. I'm not saying I believe this, but I'll give you some of the possibilities. That one was that, that some of the old Jewish fables taught that Eve had relations with the devil. And when she had relations with the devil, a seed came forth from that, which was called the serpent seed. And in Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 15, the scripture teaches that the, uh, the serpent shall bruise the heel in Genesis 3.15 of the woman, but he shall bruise his head. All right. So the prophecy is that you're going to have another child. You've already had a serpent seed. You're going to have another child, and that child will be the Messiah. All right. I'm not saying I believe that. But there's a lot of people today teaching serpent seed doctrine. How many ever heard of that? Well, you've heard it now. And when they teach serpent seed doctrine, they're teaching that Eve had relations with the devil. And they get that from the idea that angels cohabited with women. She had relations with the devil and a seed was produced. And that seed is the serpent seed. And in John 8, 44, when the Lord Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said unto them, ye are of your father the devil. He was not only speaking in a spiritual sense, but he was speaking also in a physical literal sense. Now, you can accept that or reject it. I don't, I'm not saying I believe it. I'm just simply saying I've read it. <laughs> I've read a lot of stuff, believe me. And there's a lot of people out there teaching all kinds of things that, uh, that, uh, that lead you to believe that, and they get a lot of this from Jewish fables, Jewish uh, tradition. They get a lot of it from apocryphal books like the book of Enoch, the book of Jasser, and other books like that. They get this, they get this idea and so they're strong on it. This woman up there in uh, Ohio that I've told you about who believes that the Apostle Paul was a rank heretic and that the, that, that the Pauline epistles are just a bunch of garbage written by him to take away from the Jewish kingdom. You remember now, we're on the kingdom. That uh, she believes in the serpent seed. And a lot, of, a lot of people do. And of course they get wild with it. It gets off into a lot of wild stuff. You need to remember, folks, if the Bible does not support it, leave it alone. Leave it alone. There may be elements of truth, and the truth of the matter is any big lie, any real big lie will always have elements of the truth in it, partial truth. That makes it more palatable. That makes it more believable. So uh, be careful. So uh, you, your position is one of the two. Either that you believe that the earth is restored in the first six days or you believe that, a, that, the, uh, that, uh, that in original creation or you believe that the first six days are creative days where God creates the earth. That's uh, in reference to the creation. Now, when God put Adam in that garden, he gave him dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over, living, over every living thing on the face of the earth. Adam forfeited that to Satan when he fell and Satan was handed that kingdom again. From that point on, God chose people to rule over his kingdom on this earth. In other words, what God would establish on this earth. He called Noah, 
the, the eighth person, Peter said, he called him and gave him dominion in the book of Genesis and showed him a rainbow and said, this is the seal of the covenant that we have. He called Abraham. He set forth the throne of David. One after another after another, the Lord establishes the authority on this earth where he will manifest himself and manifest the truth through those people. It's important. This is very important, folks, what I'm about to say to you right now. Every culture that has a, that has a written language, uh, if that culture has a written language, it has traditions. It has religious traditions. It has, uh, and, and every one, every one of them, outside of the Jew, uh, will have its religious traditions, it, its, its religious books, paganism or whatever. It'll have it. You either have to accept the fact that God's revelation is through one race of people, or you have to accept the fact that God gave them part of the revelation, but He also revealed Himself through the cultures of other people and through their religions. You have to make a choice. Now, let me tell you what my choice is. My choice is according to Romans chapter number 9, to the Jew was given the oracles of God. That's my choice. If something that a Greek says or a Hindu says or, or a, a Muslim agrees with the scripture, good for them. But that's not the source of authority. The source of authority is the Jew. To them was given the oracles of God. You've got to remember that. You've got to keep that. That's very important because that is, that is inspiration and that's, uh, that's where you stand. You either stand on the absolute inspiration where God chose one people. Now think about it for a moment. If God had chosen 15 different uh, 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 cultures to manifest himself, you'd have 15 different messes. <laughs> you would. They'd be in conflict with each other all the time. This is why he wrote one Bible and manifested himself to one race of people, and that's the Jew. Now a lot of folks don't like Jews, and uh, they, they, they blame them for all the, the ills of the world. And before you start blaming the Jews for the ills of the world, you need to thank some of the Jews for some of the things that we've got. That's right. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever bothered to check into it or not, but the Nobel, Peace, the Nobel Prize, until it was made a joke of here in the last couple of years. <laughs> but the Nobel Prize was a, was a, was a worthy thing. And, of course, it's issued in a lot of different fields, physics and, and what have you, uh, medicine. But uh, get home and do your own. Just type in have the recipients of the Nobel Prize and look how many of them have been Jews. Why is it? Because God blessed them. That's why. That's why. He blessed them. He gave them knowledge. He gave them abilities. He gave them organizational skills and abilities. There's a fellow in prison right now, right now by the name of Madoff. That's a good name. He made off with, <laughs> a lot. somebody said, <laughs> good name. He made off with a lot of money, right? <laughs> but folks, believe it or not, he pulled the wool over a lot of, uh, apparently, a lot of uh, highly placed uh, people who should have known better. And, he, and he, uh, he was able to embezzle billions of dollars, billions. And, uh, and of course, Mr. Madoff is a Jew. You've got to keep that in mind. The house of Rothschild, which apparently is probably the richest house on earth, and some give their, the value of their holdings at a trillion dollars or more. They can pull the money strings. They control the money. And these people are Jews. And, uh, and you know me well enough to know by listening to me that I am not an anti-Semite and I'm not a Jew hater. I'm pro-Israel right down the line. But uh, you have to give credit where credit is due. They control the money supply of this world. Make no mistake about that. And so, uh, and the reason they do, of course, is because God gave them the gift of prosperity. He showed them how to prosper. He gave them that, and they pass it down from generation to generation. And that's the way it is. And uh, after you've studied a while and learned a few things, you discover that and find out it to be true. So the kingdom of the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom. They showed up at the same time. And let me show you where that's found. Look at Mark chapter number 1 and verse number 15. And this is the first time that they'd showed up at the same time since Adam. Mark chapter number 1 and verse number 15. 
Mark 1.15. If you look at verse 14, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying, The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. And it was at hand until it went into a parabolic state. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now hold your place here and go to Matthew 4.17. And notice this. Matthew chapter number 4 and verse 17. Matthew 4, 17. And from that time, Jesus began to preach, and you'll notice this is very early, and to say, repent for the kingdom of what? Amen. Now here we have, here we have the very beginning of his ministry. On one hand, Mark says, he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Matthew says, he says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is why so many Bible interpreters and expositors say they're interchangeable. They're interchangeable. They mean the same thing. No, they don't. But they were running concurrent. They were running together at the same time because the only one qualified to wear the crown of both was the Lord Jesus Christ. Fully qualified to be king over the kingdom of God. And he was undoubtedly the Messiah of Israel, the king over the kingdom of heaven. He was both. Both. Uniquely, fully qualified to be both. And he was. But then... Something happened when they rejected that kingdom. They rejected the king and the kingdom. And because of that, the, the uh, went into a parabolic state. And then what happens is what I'd mentioned to you before about the prophecy of Isaiah 6. Remember now, the kingdom up until Matthew chapter number 13 is being offered. Then when they finally reject the king and the kingdom, the parables begin to be taught and that's when he starts warning them that they are going to be blinded. And that is found in Isaiah 6 and the last chapter of Acts. Look over here in Acts chapter 28. This scripture is quoted seven times in the New Testament. Seven times the number of divine perfection. You can't add to it. So the number eight is not addition to seven. What does number eight mean? A new beginning, exactly. Uh, Matthew, I mean Acts chapter number 28 and verse number 25. Acts 28, 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Esaias the prophet to our fathers, say to this people, go on, saying, go to this people and saying, hear ye shall hear, shall not understand, seeing ye shall see, and not perceive, and then quotes it. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known, this is a decree. Therefore unto you, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and they'll hear it. It doesn't mean that Jews couldn't be saved. They certainly could. It means that the focus now and the direction of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to the Gentiles that he would build the church of the living God. And the Apostle Paul, when he says he would make of twain one new man, talking about the merger now of Jew and Gentile into one. There is no Jewish kingdom in the church of God. There is no theocratic kingdom in the church of God. The church of God is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body, one God and Father of us all. We're all born again the same way. A Jew is not born again any differently than a Gentile is born again. There is no discretion whatsoever. God does not discriminate in any fashion. When a soul comes to him, he does not see a Jew coming to him or a Gentile coming to him or a red man or a black man or a yellow man or a white man. He sees a sinner in the church of God. And we're all born again, born of the Spirit of God. Once in that body, once in the body of Christ, there's neither bond nor free, Jew nor Greek, none of this. The identity is gone. Once you are in the body of Christ. That's not so with the Jewish kingdom. Not so at all. Not so at all. The Jewish kingdom is a, is, a, is a theocratic kingdom where God reigns over his people through an earthly representative. A king on the throne of David. Now, here's the thing. That kingdom's coming back. 
But it's not coming back for him to reign over the church. When he comes back to reign, the church will reign with him. But he will sit on the throne of David. According to the scripture, he'll sit in Jerusalem. And he'll reign over the house of Israel on the throne of David as the king under the Davidic line that he was promised when he was born by Gabriel that he shall sit on the throne of his father David. He has yet to do that, but he will do that when he comes back and personally reigns on this earth. And he'll do that. When does he do that? He's not doing it now. He won't do it in the tribulation. He'll do it in the millennium. And that's why I'm premillennial. He'll come back and reign for a thousand years on this earth. That means then that, if, that we've got a thousand years to repent. It doesn't matter if you had a million years to repent. If the Holy Spirit doesn't convict your heart, there'll be no repentance. Do you think time produces repentance? No. None of that will, will produce repentance. <clears throat> Always, if you don't agree with somebody and the facts won't support your position, the way to deal with them is to demonize them. You following me? If you don't like somebody's position and your facts won't support, you can't defeat him with the facts, then the way to do it is the way the lawyers do it in the courthouse. If they've got a witness on the stand that is tearing their case to pieces, they know they can't deal with the facts. So what does that lawyer do? He goes after their character. That's immediately what that attorney does. He goes after their character. He can't deal with the facts, so he'll destroy their character. And some of them are good at it. Very good. And if they're real good, they can get very emotional and put on a real good act. <laughs> some of the best acting you've ever seen in your life takes place in the court of law. They ought to hand out Oscars for some of the performances that go on in there. <laughs> Amen. I'm serious as I can be. So, uh, where do we stand now? Well, here was, here's where we are. He's calling a Gentile bride, a Gentile bride. There's a type of that in the Old Testament. There was a servant that was sent. And uh, Abraham the father says, I will not have for my son one of these daughters of Canaan. So he sent him back to his family. He sent a servant back, and his name was Eleazar. And he went, he said, now you go find a bride for my son. All right. All right, Abraham is a picture of God the Father. Eleazar is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And uh, he goes and he finds her where? Where does he find her? At a well. He finds her at a well. Fountain of living water. He finds her. Water is always connected with salvation. In every perspective you can imagine. From Genesis 1 through Revelation. And Rebecca. That's her name. Rebecca. Which is a beautiful name. And in Hebrew it means she is so beautiful that she lays a snare for a man. Once he sees her. He's, 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 uh, he's encapsulated for the rest of his life. He can't take, it, take his eyes off of her. So while Isaac is in the field, mourning the death of his mother Sarah, who's a type of Israel, Eleazar comes with Rebekah, who had answered him at the well, will you go with this man? And that's what the church does. We have to give an answer to the Holy Spirit. We will go. So Eleazar takes Rebekah out of the house of Laban and he takes her back with him into the house of his father or the land of his father. And on the way, the Bible says, while Isaac was in the field mourning the death of his mother, Sarah, he saw the camels coming. <laughs> he saw the camels coming. And the camels were coming. The camels were coming. And the, I pray to the Lord God, the camels are coming. The camels are coming. And they will come. And he will come. He will come. And of course, she becomes his bride. And uh, from that union, two lines of people are born. Two lines of people are born from the union of, uh, of uh, Isaac and, uh, and Rebecca. Who are they? You know, what are their names? You've got two. Mm -hmm. You sure do. And uh, these uh, two, different, uh, two different types of people and uh, two different kinds. All through the Bible at the births, you've got one type here, one there. One family here, one there. One line here, one line there. 
So I'm glad, thank God. He's coming. He's coming. The camels are coming. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, brother. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, no, what was it? Grace. Grace. All right. The camel's name was Grace. <laughs> I won't argue with that, brother. <laughs> yes, sir. That's what the old Jewish the old Jewish tradition teaches that. Yes, they're the first ones with it. Well, when the first, yeah, yeah, that's where the cane comes from. Well, I've never known that, that a, uh, you could have two fathers on all twins. I've never I think you can. Yeah, yeah I, I got into that one time. I think you can, yeah. Yep. No, but you can, yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's an oddity, a rarity, a rare thing, but yeah, you can. This is why Cain, the Bible says, was of that wicked one. A lot of things in the Bible talks about Cain. Uh, but the problem with all that is where the Lord said to Cain, he said, if thou doest well, wilt thou not be accepted? He gave him an offer. The Lord gave Cain an offer. He gave him an opportunity there. He did. He, he gave him an opportunity. So if Cain, if Cain had been a product of the union of Satan, why, he wouldn't have offered him salvation. But yes, you can. Yes, you can. You sure can. All right, well, that word prayer won't let you go. All right, Brother Chapin, dismiss us, please.